That's what it's all about, being in his presence. Thank you for that. I just need to pray one more time. Father, help me. I really need you right now. You know, there's so much to share. Please help me to share only what you want right now. And I thank you, Father. Thank you for these precious, precious sisters and daughters of Christ. Bless each one. Lord, speak to them what you want them to hear. Just minister to their hearts. We just pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit as never before. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I, um, it's been such a, a privilege to be here with you. You're I've just enjoyed talking one-on-one -on -one with so many of you and just hearing a little bit of your stories and just appreciate the love and the friendship that you've given me. And uh, I don't know that we'll meet here again, but I won't be coming to every one of your churches that I know about anyway. <laughs> but I, I do look forward to meeting you in heaven. And I think after we've been there praising God for at least a year, maybe we could meet at the Tree of Life on the northeast side because I really want to hear how God's worked in your lives. You probably, in your midst of packing, didn't bring this paper, uh, but I'm just going to go over it briefly. It's about a, some suggestions for beginning the experience of abiding in Jesus' love. Um, there's a pastor, Dale Lehman. He's, one of his family members said to him one day, you're always smiling and happy at church. But at home, you're depressed and grouchy. You know, that doesn't fit. What's wrong? And he took it to heart, started praying about it, even asked his church members to pray. It was at a time they were doing the 10 days of prayer. So he told them, he said, I'm in a dry place. Would you pray for me? And God led Dale to stop um, using his worship time in the morning to prepare his sermon. That's what he'd always done. But instead, he started using that time just to get to know God. And he just started coming to God and saying, God, I, I need to know you love me. I need to love you. And God led him on a beautiful experience. But what Dale learned was it's not just about spending time with God whenever you choose to do it, but it's about abiding in Jesus all day long and letting Jesus abide in you. So I'm just going to briefly go through this. Number one, uh, first I want to say, yeah, number one, dedicate the first hour to making yourself emotionally available to Jesus. Determine to open the door of your heart every day until Jesus comes in. Now, for you who are young mothers with little children, there's no way you're going to come up with an hour in the morning or anywhere in the day to spend that time. But what I have, and it was a really hard on my... Um, daughter-in-law, my older one. She's got three kids now. But I remember her calling me crying. She said, I always loved my time with God in the morning, but now it's just so hard. And I told her, I said, you know, it's okay. Jesus understands. Just somewhere in the day, maybe spend five minutes or so. And she started doing that. But now God has let her, you know, the kids are a little bit older to how she can do it even longer periods. But don't get discouraged. Um, God understands you've got little kids pulling at every direction, but somewhere in the day, you can turn off that TV, you can turn off that internet and open your Bible, even if it's for five minutes, and pray and read God's Word. That will grow and will grow as you keep doing that. I have found as a young mother, I personally wasted a lot of time. I thought I was so busy, but there are moments that we can come up with. Number two, use the gospel. This is, remember now, this is for beginning the experience. Some of you are past this. Uh, but use the gospel of John or desire of ages. Desire of ages is all about the life of Jesus. And it's the most powerful book. But the gospel of John, Psalms, or one of the devotional books. Or I don't know if you've heard of Andrew Murray's book, Abide in Christ. But it is so good. Of, of showing you, teaching you how to abide in Jesus all day long. It's a book I reread and reread. Desire of Ages I reread and reread as well as the Bible. But I want to say, I don't know how it is for you, but even to this day, it, it happened to me more earlier, but even now it still can. I'll go to pick up my Bible to read it, and I'll get this thought, 
you know, this is really boring. You have read this many times. What good's it going to do you? Or I'll get the thought, you know, this is really too deep and too hard. Uh, you don't have much time this morning. Uh, you're not going to be able to do deep study, so there's no point. Just, just read a devotional book or something. Or I'll get the thought, you know, you are so sinful, so bad. You blew it so bad yesterday. There's no way reading a little bit of scripture this morning is going to help you. You'd need to read the whole book in order to get any help. Do any of you get those thoughts like I do? I want you to know, if you don't realize it, those are from Satan. And don't believe him. Tell him to get behind you. Get out of the house. God's word is, Jesus says it's, it's, it's his spirit, it's his life. It's his healing power coming into you. And I don't care if you just read Leviticus, which is, can be pretty boring, or the wars, the armies. When you open God's word and you read it, God's grace and healing power flows into your life. I have been healed by just reading God's word. Over and over, just reading and reading God's word. There's nothing can do for you what God's word can. Yes, you can be blessed by other books, but nothing will do for you what this book will do. Don't let Satan keep you away from it. And you know, with my extremely busy life, it's just constant. It, it, we're traveling to over 200 days a year, but then when we're home, you've got to be at the office. You've got committee meetings and all this. And I produce a magazine, and you've got this magazine and deadlines, and just on and on it goes. And then, of course, you know, you get re-voted in every five years, and you want to look successful. You want to get voted in again. So, you know, you've got to be busy, busy, busy to look good. It's easy to get caught up in all that. But Jerry and I learned early on, no way. If I don't have Jesus Christ, there is no point in living. There is no point in doing good for my neighbors or anybody else if I don't have him. And I can't have him if I don't spend time with him. But you know, another thing too that will happen, um, and I had this happen about a year and a half ago or so, a really dry, dry time. You ever been through that? You don't sense his presence. You don't, you don't sense God speaking to you through the word. And it's just dry. And, and I would do everything I could think of in my worship time, trying to make it meaningful and nothing. I finally told God one day, I said, God, if you never speak to me again through your word, if you never let me sense your presence again, if you never fill my heart with joy again, I will continue to serve you and spend this time with you. I will continue to worship you because there's nothing else in life that matters. Amen. And you know, I'm convinced we've got to come to that point in our lives. Uh, God allows dry times to draw us into a deeper, deeper experience with him till we really realize that nothing is important as Jesus Christ. But the times I was talking about, you know, it's just so busy and you've got these crises and, and maybe I've got to speak today or something and I'm just a nervous wreck. I can't concentrate on reading God's word. I can't concentrate on reading anything. But what I'll do is, is I just say, God, help me, help me, help me to concentrate. And it may be only one Bible verse. That's as far as I'll get. But I'll keep saying it over and over and over again, just saying it out loud. God, help me to get something out of this. Lord, give me your peace. And there's something about even one Bible verse that no amount of other pages will do for me what God's word will do. And uh, that, that, maybe you found it different, but I've sure found this book is powerful. What it does, we go on, it says, number three, have no agenda, such as reading through the Bible or study a presentation or completing a book or the Sabbath school lesson, only seek to experience his love. Our family decided at one time, uh, my son's idea was, let's read th through the Bible together so that we can talk about it when we're together. Well, he picked a reading plan that was like five chapters a day. And so I started doing this and, oh, you know, I got I to gotta keep up with the family. I got to get this read and just reading, reading, reading. And you know what happened with me is I lost my experience with God. And I thought, what's wrong? What's wrong? And what I realized was, normally when I read, 
It was just slowly. And as I would read, I would let God lead me to praise him, to give him thanks. Or maybe I might say, Lord, how does this apply to my life? Or God might lead me to confess a sin. Or he might lead me to pray for somebody or some situation. But I would just go slowly and, and write in my journal of uh, what you know, was happening, what God was saying or, or what I wanted to say to God. And I lost all that when I was trying to read through the Bible in a year and just you know, read as fast as I could to get these things written, uh, you know, read. So I don't know how it is for you. I know people read through their Bible in a year and they're very blessed by that. I'm just sharing with you. For me, I've got to go slowly and let the Holy Spirit lead me as I go through it and to think about it. And you go on, number four, he said, pray my mind, pray this, my mind knows you love me, God. Now I want to know it with my heart. Possess me, embrace me, overwhelm me with your love. Live in me. Thank you for loving me. Number five, pray, read, listen, write. Pray, read, listen, write. Now, writing may not be for everybody. I know um, a lot of people don't like to. And, and if I take a notebook and if I just write out my whole prayer, I will never look at it again. But for me, what works is I keep a notebook, or now because I travel so much, I actually do it on my computer or my phone in Evernote. But I, I will just write in big capital letters whatever the burden is on my heart. Like right now, uh, Leah, pregnant with twins, high-risk pregnancy, you know, just in big capital letters with a date by it. And, but whatever it is I write, when God answers, I come back and write in the margin in red that it's answered and just briefly how. You know, if I wait till I can write down details, I'll never do it. And so I'll just write briefly. And that has been such a blessing. Because I, I talked about that Friday night. That becomes your testimony. That is your way marker in life. When you, you're doubting and discouraged. It, but God doesn't have you do that just for you. He will use it to bless other people's lives. And I can't encourage you enough to, to write, somehow write it down. My husband loves New Year's, New, New Year's morning. He gets up early New Year's morning to go through his journal for the past year and highlights in yellow all the answers to prayer. And in the back, he actually makes like an index and gives them all page numbers. And just New Year's Day is a day of praise. Not football, but praise in our house because God has been so good. And you see what happens is like we had to speak somewhere we had... Uh, been there within the last year in that area where we'd had much, much time to speak. And Jerry says, you know, we're back in the same similar area. What are we going to talk about? We've shared so much. And I thought, and I prayed, and I said, well, let's just share what's happened this last year. And Jerry said, Janet, we have a whole hour. I said, well, go read your journal, Jerry. So he did, and he comes back quite a while later and says, Janet, so much happened this last year, but I forgot. I forgot what had happened. And he said, and I have so much to share now, and I have to share the hour with you. <laughs> but it is really true. As I said Friday night, what was Israel's biggest problem? They forgot. They forgot what God had said. It, it is our problem. It is our problem over and over again. It is so important. It will mean so much. I cannot tell you how many women I've had email me or write me or see them or somewhere tell me how this has changed their life. Just starting to write, write down those prayer requests. But also, you know what happens if you start writing down the prayer requests? You'll start seeing blessings and surprises that you haven't even prayed about. You're spending time with God every day. God is just running to try to bless your life. You will have things you've just wished in your heart start happening. Blessings and surprises that will come on. Write those down. But also write down what God says to you. Uh, just briefly again. And you know why you need to write it down? I was one time having my worship and God was saying, you know, what you said to so-and-so yesterday was not very good. You need to apologize. Oh, okay, I I'll do that. But I don't. I forget about it. But if you have it written down so you see it, it's in your face, you go and do it. You remember to do it. 
But if you feel like God, God hasn't been speaking to you, or maybe he used to and he hasn't, think back to the last time God spoke to you. Are you doing? Are you doing what he said? And also, the, the handouts we're giving you, there's a bigger, thicker one, but I didn't want to totally overwhelm you with paper, uh, called Experiencing God. It's on Revival and Reformation website, and you can download each section or the whole thing. It's like up to 60 pages, I think, now. It's just things that we keep adding that Jerry and I find meaningful for us. But in there in the back, it's just homespun. I put together all the quotes that I found at the moment on hearing God's voice and the Bible text about hearing God's voice. And one of the things she, Ellen White talks about is we need to be very careful. Satan will disguise himself to make us think it's God speaking to us when it's Satan. And we need to have spiritual mentors around us that, that we get some crazy idea, whatever, that, that we talk to about, that will pray with us about it, not just talk to us. Uh, we are never a one-man island. Don't think, well, God has told me this. I don't care what the Bible says or what anybody else says. God has spoken to me. That, that's from the devil. God does not do that. God never goes against his word. He will never tell you to do anything that your, his word does not say. But those things that are in the gray area, whatever, you know, have, for me, it's my husband is my spiritual mentor. If I didn't have Jerry, it would be some woman that I know really prays that would be the one I would go to. You go on, um, oh, I just, I'm just going to share it brief. It's going to be hard for me to do. But my, my, my sons, I never taught them how to find the right wives. I, I, I didn't realize you needed to. I just thought it happened, which is dumb, I know. But so, so it, this happened twice. But with my older boy... I got so desperate because of the girl he was planning to marry. I started writing into my journal, Dear God, this is the kind of wife my son needs, not that girl he, th he thinks he's in love with and going to marry, because she'll cheat on him and run off on him. And I put in great detail the kind of wife he needed. And I, 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 I mean, I told God, I said, I don't want a pew sitter. I want someone that's passionate about winning souls for the kingdom. Uh, Lord, I want someone that'll love and respect, cherish my son, that'll be faithful to him. God, I want someone that'll cook healthy food for my grandkids and won't <laughs> stick them in front of a TV. And, just, I'm, and then I put, I don't want a mall shopper. I want a hiker, Lord. That was selfish because I like to hike. I hate to shop. And, um, and just great detail. And every once in a while, I'd write this again and again. There is not time to tell you the story, but we serve a God with a sense of humor and a delightful, amazing God. But my son has been married 16 years now to the most godly woman. I wish she'd have been around to help me raise my kids. Just a, teaching my kids to love God, got them involved and in reaching out and just, just pre healthy meals. I wish I could tell you the story. But it just, God will do this with any of us if we will spend that time with him. You know, it's about having a relationship with God. It's not about having answers to prayer. And when that becomes the ultimate desire in your heart to really love and know your God and let him love you, it's amazing the things that will happen in your lives. And I'll see some of you nodding your heads. You know what I'm talking about. But I thought, you can't put God in a box and do this twice. But I got desperate with my second son. This woman just attached onto him and... And, and I knew it wasn't going to be good. She was going to cheat, run around on him. You know, it just, it's not good. As a mother, you've lived many years, you know what it will be like. But you can't tell your son, at least I couldn't when they're in love, that this is not a good choice. But you can sure pray, and your confidential prayer partners can pray. I didn't even have to tell my prayer partners. They knew, they could tell, and they started praying on their own and with me. And, but... I started writing again, this is the kind of wife my son needs, Lord, please. And I thought, it took me a while to do that, because I thought, I can't make God do the same thing twice. You know, I didn't make him do it the first time, actually, but, but you, you feel like, oh, well, maybe you helped. But I, I, you just can't do that to God. But I got so desperate, I started writing again, Lord, this is the kind of wife my son needs. Long story, but to make it short, I'm sitting... I, the, a young girl took an interest in me, 
a lot of young people will take interest in you. I'm amazed. I'd ask them, why are you interested in me? I'm an old person. They said, because I want to know God like you know him. I want to have that relationship or they want to hang out with my husband and I. We want to see a good marriage. We don't know what it looks like because of their homes. God wants to use each one of you to reach the younger ones. If some of you are young, but even the younger ones in your churches. Don't live life just for yourself. So many need it. But this young girl took an interest. She started calling me and said, could we pray together on the phone? I didn't have time for this. But I thought, okay, I, I, you know, I need to do this. So we started praying together. I, I got to know her because I co uh, coordinated youth prayer conferences and girls retreats. And I saw she was really good at administration, like Gina. So I said, you know, get her helping me. And she was amazing. And so she wanted to pray together. Well, when we pray, I would pray about the things she needed. But at the end, I'd always pray. And I've done this a lot with young people. I would pray, Lord, in your timing, when it's right, bring the right young man into her life. But in my heart, I would pray. And I also wrote it in that journal. God, could it be my son? <laughs> but then I realized... My son is not worthy of such a Holy Spirit filled girl. And there's not time to share that story, but at that time, my son was not living right. And um, a lot of it was, is I pled before God, what's wrong, God? Why don't you convert my son? God let me know I needed to change. And God cha kept changing me. And as God changed me, my son changed. And, but anyway, so I, I would pray this with her. But finally, I realized, you know, my son's not worthy of such a Holy Spirit-filled girl. She'd never want my son. And my son, because of the way he is, probably wouldn't want her. Lord, make my son worthy of such a Holy Spirit girl. And I'd write that down. Make my son worthy of such a Holy Spirit girl. And I would claim Bible promises. I would try pray scripture into my son's life. I don't know if you do that. You can take Colossians. You can take Ephesians. You can take all of the Bible and pray it into your kids' lives. It's, it's powerful. And I'm, I'm going to jump tracks here. <laughs> my older boy, he knew in college he need, that God was calling him to be a, an attorney, a lawyer. But, but lawyers have a bad name. They're not respected. He did not want that. He wanted a job where he'd be respected. And he, anyway, ended up, after he's married, a baby's on the way, says, I've got to go to law school. I just feel compelled to do this. So he has to do it at night. That means he's working all day to support his family and going to night school. Guess what? His grades are very poor. He's not going to make it through law school. His wife and I started calling, because we lived five hours apart, started calling each other on the phone and praying together. And I told her, pray for God to give you what scriptures to pray into his life. And what I felt God led me to was Daniel, Daniel 1. And in Daniel 1, down a little ways, it says God gave Dan Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself in any way. We would pray that into Tyson, that Tyson will not defile himself in any way. And the next is God gave favor to Daniel with the chief of the eunuchs. And we would pray, God, give Tyson favor with the professors in the school. Well, my husband would tease me and say, well, I hope he doesn't become a eunuch with you praying this. He, he so far has not been. He's got three kids. So, but we saw the professors start giving him favor. There was a picture taken of the teacher wanted him to co-teach with him. And the look in that professor's eyes toward my son told you the admiration that was there. They gave my son awards, several of the professors. But that kid, and, and then later on it says, God gave Daniel and his three friends all wisdom and knowledge and dreams and visions. Tyson, as far as I know, has never had the dreams or visions. But God has filled him with the knowledge and wisdom. He went from low grades to the top third in his class. He graduated third in the class with all these fancy decorations. And, and this... The grades were not figured on just the night school, because night school was like 500 students. But the grades were figured on the day students as well as the night. We're talking about 14, 1,500 students. And God took him from there to there. And Tyson, if he were here, will tell you it was a miracle of God, what he did for him. But he did more than that. When Tyson graduates, it's right at the time when the economy crashed terribly in 2008 or seven. 
where it was. And, and there was no jobs for lawyers because there's no businesses going on, building going on, all these things where you need lawyers. There were no jobs. There was more than 300 lawyers out of work in California where we were living at the time. And, but God, it's an amazing story, but God gave him a job. The, the boss created a job because he wanted to hire Tyson. Now that does not mean he made it easy. Huge problems. A lot of things kept happening. Tyson has had to really struggle. Uh, things have gotten better now. Uh, he just won a huge case. But it's put him on his face before God. Those troubles, those problems that happen to our kids, you cry, your heart's broken, you plead and beg for them. But God's using it to grow them, to make them tough and strong in him. And so it, it just... In, in God led my daughter-in-law to pray the book of Joseph into his life. And, and of course, James 1.5, claiming wisdom and all. But it's powerful, God's word. It's more powerful than our own words if we will pray scripture, claim promises when we pray. So my younger boy, um, I'm, I'm sitting at his graduation, not his graduation, this girl that I've been praying with at, at the graduation of her from high school. And I'm sitting there, and I could only come for Sabbath, and Friday night and Sabbath, and then I had to leave to go on to another appointment. But I wanted to support her. And so I, I'm there watching her as she comes down the church aisle. She's not in a graduation, just a Sabbath close. And as I'm watching her go down the aisle, I suddenly felt like I was at her wedding. And I go... And I looked at her again, and it was like a bride with flowers, smiling, going down the aisle. And I thought... I have been working too hard. I'm just not getting enough sleep. And I looked again. And then I thought, God, are you trying to tell me something? And just that faint thought, she's going to marry your son. I thought, no way. My son's not worthy of such a Holy Spirit-filled girl. And he's planning to marry this other girl. She's nothing like her. He's never been drawn to that type of girl. But to make a long story short, They've been married now 10 years. I am telling you, I don't know what's going on in your lives. But don't give up. Your God loves you. You may feel like everything's coming apart, but your God loves you. He is there. Just reach out your hand and say, God, I need to know you're here. Keep, keep, don't give up. Number six, at the slightest emotional experience of his love, thank him, praise him. Thus you express faith and your awareness of him will increase joyfully. Step out in faith. You may not feel like anything's happened when you have your worship time. You don't feel like God's speaking to you. You don't feel his presence. Thank him. Start stepping out in faith and thank him for his presence. Thank him for his joy, even though you don't feel it. Step out and believe. And God, it will happen at the right time. It's not time to go over the back page, but it just talks about the seven daily essentials for abiding in Christ. And I just have found that to be a blessing when, when I saw what Dale wrote. It's what God had been doing with me for, for several years, but here's a, he put it on paper, and I thought, this is great. I've got to share it with others. Um, you've heard of the book, The ABCs of Prayer by Glenn Kuhn. A lot of people make fun of that. Oh, it's claiming Bible promises. But I'm telling you, it works. It's powerful. I, I was, had a, a, somebody call me. I'm in bed sick. I was uh, in high school. He said, you've got to come and hear the, the week of prayer speaker. It's really good. So I crawled out of bed and went over there to hear him. And I, could, I just was enthralled. Just story after story as he claimed promises of what God did. So as a young teenager, uh, I think I was about a junior in, in, in school or so, um, I went home to start claiming James 1.5. See, my mother wanted me to make really good grades, and I did not. I did not like to study. I'd rather watch TV or just party, have social time. Uh, you know, studying, and she'd say, Jenna, you need to make good grades and on. So I started kneeling down, I'd, put my, I'd open my Bible, and I'd put my finger on that promise, and I'd say, God, you know my mother wants me to make good grades. So I need, he says, James 1, 5, here, that you'll give me wisdom. Lord, please give me wisdom so I can make good grades. And morning and evening, I would pray this promise. Do you know, I went from 
like low grades to straight A's. I was so shocked when I saw the grades come out. I said, that can't be my name. They made a mistake. But did God suddenly infuse me with wisdom? No. I suddenly had a desire to start studying. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? And I mean, really studying. And, and it, it just made such a big difference. But that was the beginning for me to understand that. And then, and then I had a, um, my brother just kind of went this wild way. And the first time in my life, I saw my mother on her knees in the bedroom crying and praying her heart out. And so I started looking for a scripture for my brother. First John 5:16 was perfect because it even uses the word brother. It says, if you see a brother sinning a sin that does not lead unto death, God will give him life. So I started putting my finger on that. Lord, give my brother life in Jesus. Convert him. It took two years, but God converted him and, and uh, changed his life and became a pastor and, and seen many people want to Jesus. But I, there are stories I'd love to share so, of marriages being healed, just so many answers to prayer. But you know what I see the majority of the time as I pray for things? It gets worse. The situations get worse. The husband starts running around all the more, just junk starts happening. I want to encourage you, when things get worse, don't give up. Keep praying. In Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We do not know how God has to work. But I can promise you, if you are sincerely praying, God is working. And you need to praise him and thank him that though you don't see it, I know you're working, God, and just keep thanking him. And it's amazing. The, the biggest problem that happens is we quit praying. We give up. I, I was somewhere where a lady came up to me. She says, oh, we're having so much trouble with our church school. We don't have the finances we need and just this and that. And I said to her, well, have you gotten a group together and prayed? She said, oh, yeah, we tried that. I said, oh, you tried that. Well, how long did you pray? Oh, at least three weeks. I don't know about you, but sometimes it takes years before I see answers. Our, our school was falling apart. We were praying for alumni to fix it, and alumni did. They did as much as they could, but then there was no more money. So we started praying as a prayer group. We'd meet every Wednesday. For three years we prayed, God, if you can't get Adventists to fix up this school, bring non-Adventists. Do you know God did? By the time we moved from there, God had had that man give over three million dollars to fix up that school and, and the prayers go on and on like this the answers it, our biggest thing is we quit meeting together and praying we quit we give up we get discouraged we let satan beat us up stop letting him beat you up i want you to turn with me if you have your bibles or your phone turn in your phone uh, Matthew 1. In Matthew 1, it's the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And you may have heard this. I, I've shared it a lot, many places, and so many people have been sharing it too. I first heard it from Dwight Nelson. But you know, reading the genealogy of Jesus Christ to me is rather boring. You know, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham... Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah. You know, I'm asleep by then. It's just boring. But when my eyes were opened by Dwight, you read on down. What does it say in verse 3? Judah begot Perez and Sarah by Tamar. Do you know who Tamar was? Tamar was his daughter-in-law. His, her husband had died, and uh, no brothers wanted her for some reason. And so she knows her dad, is, or her father-in-law is going on a trip, so she puts herself beside the road, dressed like a prostitute, and he has sex with her. I don't know how you could have sex with somebody and not know who they are, <laughs> but that's what happened. But he gave her something, I forget what it is, that he'll pay her later. And... So this is listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? On down. 
Look at verse 5. It says, Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. Do you know who Rahab was? She was a prostitute in Jericho. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. Do you know who Ruth was? Ruth was good, but Ruth came from the Moabites. There is not a worse people on the face of the earth than the Moabites. Terrible things they did. Then you go on down in, in verse 6. David and the king begot David the king begot Solomon by her. Now look, it names the problem, the sin. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. You know the story? David sees Uriah's beautiful wife and invites her into his palace, has sex with her, she gets pregnant. So David has to get Uriah killed. Because, yeah, anyway, that's the story. We won't go, you can read it. Uh, <laughs> but it lists the sin there. It's, it's making it plain, right? David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. This is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Then on down, 10, verse 10, Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. If you look in, in 2 Kings 21 and also 2 Chronicles 33, you will find there about Manasseh. Manasseh was an evil king. Evil king. He passed his babies through the fire on an altar to whatever god they were worshiping burned his babies, led his people to burn their babies. And on and on they did, horrible things they did. God sends a prophet to Manasseh and, and tells him, you've got to stop this. You know, this, you're hurting God and this is wrong to do this. What does Manasseh do? He says, forget you, I'll do what I want to do. So what does God do? He sends the army, Babylon, to come and they take Manasseh by the chains hooked in his nose and drag him to, to Babylon and they put him in a dungeon, a pit, down in that mud and mire. What does Manasseh do now? Manasseh cries out to God to save him. Now if I were God, you know what I would do? I know you're glad I'm not God. But I would say, forget you, you deserve it. All those babies you burned and everything you've done, Die, rot. But what does God do? You look in, in 2 Chronicles 33, uh, in verse 10 there, on down it says, Now when he was in affliction, that's when we cry out to God, isn't it? When we're in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, heard his supplications, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom and then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God isn't that amazing this is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ what do you think Jesus is trying to say to us and on down you know it, it says that, that God you know Jesus was begot because of Mary and uh, through Mary a young teenager God trusted a teenager with the Son of God it's just amazing to me. But I don't know if you doubt your salvation, if you don't think God can save you because of the bad things you've done, read your Bible. It's full of bad things. And I tell you, reading the Old Testament has been such a blessing to me to have my assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ. Just the fact Abraham, um, <clears throat> Abraham, what does he do? They go to some new area where there's a Pharaoh and the, he has a beautiful wife. You know, Abraham's list, we picture him as this big, tough monarch, this, or patriarch. He was a wimp because he lies about his wife. He doesn't want, you know, he don't want to get killed. Oh, no, she's just my sister. Well, she was his half-sister, but so it was half-truth. What does God do? God saves him out of it. But what does Abraham do a second time? He does the same thing a second time. If I were God, I'd say, forget you, not God. God's in a covenant relationship with Abraham, and he does not break that covenant. My, my husband, Jerry, when we went on our honeymoon, 
that not the first night we were in a hotel, but the second night we were in, somebody gave us a condo by the, near, near the beach. And uh, so we get to this condo and, and Jerry, you know, wants to pick me up to carry me in, but I'm a big woman. So he kind of just dragged me in <laughs> and he got me in and he set me down on the bed and he sits down next to me and he puts his arm around me and he kisses me on the cheek and he says, Janet, I love you but you have five years to get perfect or you're out. <laughs> We've been married 35 years and I'm not perfect. Jerry could tell you that, <laughs> but he has not kicked me out because we are in a covenant marriage relationship. And I know a human marriage is not a good example because there's so many divorces, but with God, we're in a marriage covenant relationship and God will not divorce you. God will not break that covenant relationship with you. The only way you can get out of it is if you walk out of it. If you turn your back on God, God will never turn his back on you. Never. Only we can walk away from him. He will always love us. And so, you know, there's been times in the past where you, you, you think, I don't know if you've been this way, but it's almost like you ever played the game of musical chairs or musical bean bags? You throw the bag and, and whoever gets it is out. Or, or musical chairs, you, you know, the music stops and everybody's got a chair but you, you're out. Have you ever felt that way? That if you're crossing the street and you've just sinned, you've just sinned, you're crossing the street and you get hit by a bus, you're out. You won't be saved. That's not your God. You're in a covenant relationship with him. You keep that daily communion, that relationship with him. You are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. My, you know, I talk about God's word and, and that's what helps to change me. And yet I know, I knew of, I've known of a couple theologians who knew the Greek and the Hebrew inside and out and they abused their daughter. They beat their son. How can that be? How can you know the Bible inside and out and do those horrible things? I've been working with that daughter for years and God is bringing her healing now, but it's not been easy. It's just like what Jesus said to the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, you know, you know the Bible, but you don't know the God of the Bible. You don't know God's word. It's so important as you read the Bible that you humble your hearts before God and say, God, search my heart. Lord, know me. God, change me. And you know, I've been fearful in the past to do that because I know I'm a, not a nice person. I'm not a good person. I'm bad. And I don't want God to show me how bad I am because I might want to go kill myself. And, and I don't want, and I just literally had to say, God, I have to trust you. You can tell me how bad I am, but you have got to change me. Because I can't. And, and um, I have to tell you, we were in the Middle East in, in the spring. And in one country, there's a woman there. She came into the church because she started watching 3ABN and wanted to learn English. She was like a, an engineer. She wanted to learn English. Well, she became converted through watching 3ABN. Well, of course, her husband was furious with that and threatened to kill her and beat her, pull her hair out, and just did everything terrible. And, but she would not give up. And he finally divorced her. Instead of killing her, he just divorced her. But he kept the children. And he, the children were with their mother enough to know they wanted the same thing that their mother had, God, Jesus. And, and he beat his daughter, did all these bad things. Well, finally, when his daughter has gotten of age and she has a choice, she wants to come see her mother and live with her mother. But she's broken. She's a mess. She's just so fearful and just, just a you know, mess. And her mother's praying, what can I do? What can I do? And she got this idea and she, her mother w would follow, uh, you know, our believe is prophets on revival reformation website. Uh, where I told you, you can register and get an email every day with that Bible chapter, like today's revelation 10, where mom was doing that. And she thought, okay, she, she told her daughter, I want you. And she gave her a notebook. I want you to start. We're in the book of Joel right now. And I want you to, to start writing, translating the book of Joel in, in, I don't know if it was translated into English or into Arabic. I missed that part. 
but translating it into another language. So her star daughter started doing this. By the time her daughter finished the Old Testament, she is changed. The girl is full of joy now. She's just, she's not fearful anymore. She's bold. Her mother was telling me this. She said, you know, at that time when she's telling me, we were now like in Luke or John. But she said, it's just changed my daughter just translating the Bible. Do you believe me? Just translating God's word, not just translating, but some people will take it and just write the Bible out, personalizing it to fit into their lives. And you can tell they just so changed. But, a, but another, another um, woman, she was converted. She grew up in an alcoholic home. All she ever heard was curse words. She's converted. She marries a pastor. She's a school teacher. She cannot get rid of this anger in these bad words. She doesn't say them out loud, but if she's upset with you, she'll call you every name in the book in her head. You know, you don't know it, but you can tell by the look on her face she was doing it. And, or at least you, you wondered. And, and so she had this problem. Her husband grew up in a home with a very domineering, severe father, and he was just fearful, scared. Some days he couldn't get out of bed. Or if he did get out of bed, he'd spend the whole day in front of the TV. He couldn't go do his work. He'd get up in the middle of the night and eat a whole half a gallon of ice cream and just crazy things. Well, God led them to start memorizing scripture. She said, I could never memorize it, but what she'd do is write a verse on a Bible card, on an index card, you know, three by five. He would memorize, and she would just carry these around with her, just a few verses, and keep reading them over and over. Every time she wanted to curse at you or whatever, she instead would read that scripture. There is power in God's word. And maybe you can't memorize, but you can put it on a three by five card or something and carry it with you. I, I, I have a scripture typer on my phone and, and it really helps you to, to memorize and you can do flashcards and have it like that on your phone. But there's something about when you're in turmoil and trouble to just take a verse of God's word and keep saying it over and over. Meditate on God's word that will bring you peace. It, it is such a blessing what it'll do for you. But I had a, um, a sin problem in my life. I got a lot of sin problems, but this one particular one that I knew I needed to stop. I knew I needed to quit. It was separating me from God. But I loved to do it. And I um, didn't know what to do. I mean, have you ever been afraid to go to God and ask forgiveness again? I mean, I had asked at least a hundred times or more forgiveness for this sin. I was afraid to go and ask forgiveness again because I knew God's got to be angry. I've asked so many times and, you know, I, I intentionally did it and all these things people talk about willful and sins and all. And I thought, oh, and, and that would separate me. That would keep me from wanting to read the Bible, keep me from wanting to pray. I didn't want to get together with groups and pray because of that sin in my life. And, and I just knew God wouldn't hear my prayers. I knew he'd have to be angry. But then I really focused in a reading 1 John 1, 9 that says if we confess our sins, does it say 392 times? It just says if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's God's work. And there's many other verses I could share with you where God says he will perfect what concerns us. It's God's business to cleanse and change us. So I started going to God and saying, God, I'm, I, I don't, I'm afraid to even come to you with this. I know you got to be angry, but your word says, and I would show him, we're, you know, here in 1 John 1, 9, it says that you will forgive me and cleanse me if I confess it. I'm confessing it to you, Lord. I'm confessing it. And I did that over and over. Every time I would do it, instead of staying away from God, I would come to him and say, Lord, I've done it again. Please, God, forgive me again and again. And I, I would pray that G Genesis 3.15, that God would give me a hatred for sin. Over and over, I keep doing this. I can't begin to tell you how many times, but I want to stress that, that it was over and over and over and over and over again. And I knew God had to be sick of hearing me. But finally, I'll never forget one day I went to do the sin and I could not do it. I was just abhorred at it. I just, it just made me shudder. And then I thought, well, I've always loved doing this sin. So I tried to do it. 
I could not do it. The power, the way to have victory over sin is to keep coming to Jesus, to keep coming and confessing and letting him cleanse us, claim his promises, let him change us. He's the one with the power, the ability to do it. And what do you do when, when things are really bad? Do you just call a friend and, and tell them all about it? Or, or do you turn to the TV and watch a bunch of movies? Or just surf the internet? Or maybe you turn to pornography. Or maybe you start drinking alcohol or take drugs. Or maybe you sit and eat a bag of potato chips or a box of chocolates. I want to encourage you that when life is so depressing and so discouraging and you've been hurt terribly, come to Jesus. Just keep coming to Jesus. That is where the power is. That is where your life will be changed as you keep coming to him. And in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John 6, 37, it says, And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. The biggest single important secret in our Christian life is to keep coming to Jesus and reading his word, meditating on it, and letting him change us. And don't believe Satan's lies about God's word. The little book you were given yesterday, Solid Foundation, Praying Scripture, it's got a lot of practical stuff there about praying scripture that I, I hope you will read. But it's been a beautiful blessing to be here with you. And I don't know. I don't know if there could be anyone here that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, I'm assuming a women's retreat, maybe everybody has. But I don't want to miss an opportunity. If there's someone here that has never accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit's prompting and working on your heart, I want to invite you just to come, come down here at the front and let the leaders of this, this retreat, just let us pray for you as, as you, uh, you make that public statement of accepting Jesus in your life. It's so important to do and saying before this universe that today I choose to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I may fall, I, I may have problems, but I am committing myself to Jesus. If there's anyone here that, that God's been working on your heart, you need to make that. Would you just come forward right now? And I know that's not easy to do. There's everybody here staring at you. But maybe if we just sing a song as, as we just wait for a moment. And you know the song. I, I, it's a simple song. You learned it as a kid, but into my heart, you know that that's the most powerful thing to do every morning is to say over and over every morning, dear Jesus, I want you to come into my heart today. It, it's amazing what it can do. But would you just sing that with me now? Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. Maybe you just need to recommit to Jesus. Maybe you're, you're, you, you've been too busy for God, and you just need to make a fresh new commitment to him. If you're feeling that way, uh, would you mind just standing as we pray and just um, tell, make a statement to God that, that today you want to make a fresh start with him? Father, Thank you for putting up with me. You're just an amazing God. And Lord, I, I know some in this room are having a really deep, good experience with you. But I know others came because they're struggling and, and they want a new, new 
experience with you. They, they want to get back with you. Lord, we know that as we go out the doors of this hotel, that Satan is just waiting to attack. Please help each one. That when he attacks with trials or problems or maybe through a loved one, that we'll look to Jesus, that we'll keep coming to you, that we'll praise your name, that we'll worship you, that we'll keep our eyes on you and your word, that we'll just keep meditating on the Bible. And we won't let anything bring us down, but that we'll become the daughters of God that you need to reach this world for you. And I thank you, Lord, for blessing each one, each one that is, has stood to recommit to you, to those who are still seated, Lord, that, that have been having a good experience but want to continue in that. Father, help us to plead and claim your promises every day for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our life and let you come in and change us and make us that loving person that this world needs. Thank you, God. I pray you'll give everyone safe travel and that you will just fill every car with your presence and minister to everyone as they drive home. Father, thank you. We look forward to the beautiful stories you're going to do in each of our lives, the people that you're going to touch and lead us to reach for you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. By the way, that, that son that was rebellious for a while, he's now a preacher, <laughs> and he dearly loves God. He calls Jerry and I to live a higher level. So pray for those kids. Don't give up. And Isaiah 44, 3 and 4 is so powerful because it's a promise that God is going to pour out his spirit on your children, your descendants. Claim that every day for those kids. God bless you, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you.